Story Models daily vlog here we are on Tuesday the 10th of November 2015 the weekend after Telford <sighs> yes over it's one of those things like Christmas you build up to it get everything in place and all the sorted and everything in and try and organize everything as best you can and then all of a sudden it's over it's gone literally and that is what Telford is like I must admit the voice is just about coming back now it did go quite well on uh, Monday um, but uh, certainly feeling still very drained from it all all the rest of it but boy is it worth it um, you've seen the pictures that I put up there we put up the little video snippets as well there are everywhere now as well um, it is one of those things it's just so big and overwhelming and I know a lot of your guys who were there this year come out and spoke to us it was your first year of being there and all the rest of it it's huge it's one of those big things where you just don't know where to start you know you're looking around there you're thinking okay I'm obviously looking at kits your aftermarket and then you realize that everybody's there all the aftermarket companies and before you know it you spend an absolute fortune Anyway, it was absolutely fantastic to see as many of you as we did. Um, we were, had a fantastic weekend. It was great to meet you, answer your questions, get your feedback, uh, sell our items and everything else. Sorry we ran out of stock of dark dirt by the end of the day, two types of sanders uh, and the wash sets as well. So um, we actually totally sold out which is great but if you didn't obviously don't forget you can still buy them at any point from the website so there we go what did i get there now normally i don't get a chance to look around and go around telford at all this year i did i did spend about i think about an hour and a half i had a bit of mosey around uh, saturday afternoon uh, which is unusual for me but uh, we did go around and then sunday morning during press time uh, we went over to the actual um competition area and had a look around there now we have got a small confession at this point because Sid did a fantastic job going around filming absolutely everything on the camcorder uh, he did all the uh, individual stands and all the bits and pieces so I just did little short videos on my iPhone and then I did some little photos around here and there on my iPhone and things like that and the competition area just things that took my eye expecting to use Sid's footage unfortunately I've come to it this morning to honestly to start to edit it to put it together with this and it's not there we've got no footage I think the SD card has failed or the camcorder did something in between but whatever it is it didn't come out so a bit of a blow but never mind there's always next year as I said to him not to worry there's still fantastic amounts of photos various things up there I'm sure you're going to get bored to death through it very very quickly um, but uh, needless to say we had a lot a lot of fun from my point of view I had a couple of purchases this little bad boy, thanks to Steve, uh, he spotted it again. I wanted it last year and I waited too long and then it sold out. Uh, but is the uh, 132nd, this is the X15 with the, uh, the, the tanks on it. Uh, with the fuel tanks uh, fitted to it and it comes with the, the dolly on the back as well so it's slightly different to the other version so I've eventually got that. Uh, thanks to Paul at Little Cars because I went to chat him up and he kindly gave us a colour cup lid. Yes all those paint spills and all the bits and pieces I get and all the time I said to him I'll pop back I need to pick one up and he kindly brought us one over so a big thank you to Paul at Little Cars. Uh, Richard from Scale um, uh, magic scale modeling now this is for the lights that we use for the typhoon for the flickering and the blinking and all the rest of it I had a long discussion with him uh, over the during the course of the show and all the rest of it and he showed me what's in the pipeline and what they've got coming at the moment and there is some amazing setups coming with them we're going to work with them a little bit probably next spring summertime for with an upcoming project they've got and it's going to tie in perfectly with something that I've got in mind as well but in the meantime uh, obviously we all know we had those terrible problems with the, I get in here with the um, motor well this is their motor system now this is a little tiny one okay this is a little baby one down on here and this is the got the other half of it is the setup we can get it out of here obviously we'll do a full reviews a little bit later but this has got the power pack okay for this one and the actual motor itself so these are proper motors not these horrible airfix things that absolutely stung me to death um, because obviously it didn't work when we come to do the typhoon but also i've seen these running on a circuit board so actually you've got a startup sequence and the lights all start up and the lights flash and then the engine chokes uh coughs splutters then fires up to life and all the rest of it it runs the lights obviously are on and then obviously it cuts out little project I've got coming up in the actual spring for this one we're going to be using these guys and everything else like that but you can get these kits from those 
from these guys and obviously you've got all the instructions about using them uh, and all the bits and pieces down on here we've used them before great guy obviously if you've got any requirements just have a word with richard and you can sort them out this is is that the medium one uh de -de 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 -de. yes i think so this is the other one i remember rightly we just get in here that's it wrong end come through get in get you somewhat separate ah right yeah this is the tiny tiny one Okay, so we've got a tiny, tiny little one here. This is like a, a, a one, probably four, four engine. You could get away in a model being absolutely tiny. This one is a slightly bigger one, just like that. So as you said, if you've got any type of scale model and you want to put an engine that runs in it and runs nicely, unlike that thing we had, then obviously have a word with them and they can sort you out here. But these are a couple of little projects we've got coming up, obviously, next year. So we're looking at them. Mel, in her infinite wisdom, saw Mel's drive-in, okay, diner. This is the uh, Mobius one. So she's going to be building this at some point. So, you know, strap yourself in for that one. The other thing we do have to mention is this little guy. We've got down here a World War I machine gunner, hand-painted, beautifully done, and everything else like this. Now, this guy was left on our display so it's somebody's uh, but none of us can remember who okay it didn't have a tag so we were assuming he was with something else um, so if you had anything world war one ish and you are missing a uh, a gunner then uh, we've got him so let us know and i'll get him packed up safely and shipped off to you okay either that or he's going to find his way onto my diorama with my world war one tank okay so if he does look very familiar shoot me a pm on the site or contact me and then i'll make sure he's safely returned to you but apart from that this year we didn't have anything else that sort of went missing so that was really really well my voice is still going so there we go that was telford obviously amazing thank you so much to everybody who helped out with us thanks to all the team you are amazing as ever and uh, everything else like that so anyway it is tuesday it is q a day so what we're going to do is work way through some of your questions for the next sort of half an hour or so and then uh, hopefully we'll give you some of your answers so carrying on from where we were last week we'll try and catch up a little bit of this um uh, lou has put in and said my question is uh, you've done your model, you've done your paint, your clear coat, your decals, clear coat, hate the result. What is the easiest way to strip it off or is it just easier to buy another kit? Now, actually, I should have videoed it. Before we went to Telford, my demo parts that you see me use the wash on and the buffers and all the bits and pieces, um, obviously they get horrible over the course of the actual show. So they had sat in a box and then on Thursday, I think it was. Yeah, it was Thursday. John was here helping to load up. Um, I stripped them back. I do them in an IPA bath. Uh, that's isopropyl alcohol. Uh, it's 99.8% alcohol. It's lethal. Um, so what you actually do is just make a little bath of it, very thin coat, and then place it down in there or just brush it all over your model sits for a bit and then it just rips through everything but it won't affect your clear parts your glue your filler or anything else like that that's my personal choice of doing it of course you could go in there with oven cleaners mr muscle power spray things like that they will roughly do the same thing what you don't want to do is be in a situation of using something that you're going to have to scrub and get in there you want something that you can put on and literally rinse under the tap and it washes it all away our buster which is a good point. I don't know where Buster is. Buster, I haven't seen him. He's not come home yet because he went to the show with us. Um, he has had a bath at some point in his life. It's a very old one now. It must be five years ago now. Uh, but his was the IPA trick. It's my preferred way. I find it clean, easy, very easy. Just rinse it under the tap and it all just washes away and go like that. So that would be my chosen one. But it depends on how far you want to go. You know, decals, they tend to get in the way. I tend to, to rip decals off with some good, strong tape. So you just put that over the top of the decal, rip it off, and you'll find it sticks to the tape. Then you can get down to all the paintwork. And that way, you could just decide to give it a rub down and a respray uh, rather than stripping it all back. But if you did, I would suggest the IPA route. Okay, come on, come back to me. This one's been playing up just a little bit. Uh, 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 oh, no, we turned it off. Come on, that's it. There we go. Okay, so there we go, Lou. Hope that helps. Okay, Mark asks Hi, Phil. Can the AK Extreme paints be used with a brush for more detailed parts? Not really. Uh, a bit like trying to do it with an clad, very, very thin. Now, don't get me wrong, they do. And if you watch, uh, what would it be, tomorrow be the last part of the Starfighter, you'll notice I use it for dry brushing and I dry brush the seat with it. 
it works very well like that. But for actually painting something, uh, I would probably go down the route of, like I've got the actual Mr. Uh, metal colors, which are my hand painting uh, colors that I use for things like that. Uh, if you notice up there now, what I've got is Mr. Metal Color and the AK stuff. I've got rid of all my other ones. They've all gone uh, now. Uh, they're my two colors of actual choice for this. The Vallejo acrylics, are hand paintable, you can do things with those, but again, they don't like big areas, they're quite thin by their nature, so sometimes it's nice just to have a silver for hand painting, for doing things like pipes, hoses, little things, bits and pieces like you do, hydraulic type things, uh, and then obviously you can have obviously more airbrushy ones behind it, and things like that. But I wouldn't suggest it for them, I don't think they're really designed for that. Okay, Ray says, hi Phil, uh, a quick non-modeling related question. Where do you get your Vader recruitment planks? Ah, that's the one over there. You mean, I just turn you around. Oh. As everyone's gonna be wondering what the hell we're on about. You mean that one? Yes, to be honest, that one was, make sure you're facing the right way. <clears throat> that's straightforward, very eBay. I think if you just put in there um, Empire uh, poster, um, Star Wars posters, things like that. He comes up all the time. You'll see next month I've got a load of them. It's just I haven't actually got anywhere to put them. So what I'm going to do is sort of redecorate the studio for our Star Wars theme. Um, and I've got other ones. I've got blueprints of uh, the Star Destroyer, which is a poster, blueprints of X-Wings and things like that. But it comes a poster. Um, so, you know, but basically eBay, just have a look on there. If I remember, it wasn't very expensive either. I think it was about a fiver for that one. Uh, delivered as well. So not too bad, but I've had it quite a while now and he's been up there for ages like that. Uh, right, okay. Robert says, hello, Phil, quick one. What advice would you give a modeler who is considering uh, uh, beginning to make uh, and upload videos on YouTube. Uh, what are some of the things you have learnt, Crikey? <laughs> what would you uh, do without, and uh, maybe uh, some that no, were never needed? Uh, right, it's a massive thing. Don't forget, I've been doing this now for the last. How long have we been doing YouTube? Don't forget, we weren't on YouTube to start with. We only were on, been on YouTube now for about the last five years. Before that, we had our own server, uh, and I used to do videos like that because YouTube was horrible. I think you could only have 10-minute clips, so it's only when they went big time that we switched over. Um, what advice? First of all, lighting. Lighting is absolutely everything. If you want it to be sharp, clean, uh, and all the rest of it, forget doing face-to-face, -face, because that way you need these huge, big LEDs. But working down here, you need some type of daylight system, and you need two light sources, okay? Otherwise, what's gonna happen, you're gonna have shadowing. All right, so that is your very first one you really wanna look at. Obviously, your camcorder, um, you know, you want it to be shooting in the higher res. Ideally, you want to be shooting, obviously, at 1080, things like that. Most camcorders do it now. Quite frankly, my iPhone's pretty good at it uh, as well. So that's not so much a, of an issue. And then it's just a case of, you know, just making sure you're clear. Yeah, when things are in front of you, making sure they're clear, it's easy to see. Because all too often I see other people do it, it's very cluttered. Uh, and things like that. And I think it's very hard to see exactly what they're doing um, and things. So nice clean cutting mat, nice clean work areas. You know, a camera above looking down works fantastic every time. Not so much a fan of these guys who have it in front of them looking down, because to me it always looks backwards. I know from a fact of feedback over the years that people prefer a camera to either be above you looking the same way you do. So it's from your perspective, okay? So I, what I mean is, is that when the camera's looking down as you see it, you see me where you would almost be looking down from, but if you're stood from, don't try to do it back to front, because also you end up having to rotate items. So when you're showing things, you're always doing this back to front to the camera and painting, it's easier to have it in front of you like this, okay? After that, it's really personal choice. You know, at the end of the day, you can have one camera, you can have two cameras. Sometimes I think people overdo it with the cameras. We run four, but as you notice during editing, I try and stick to two or three. I don't use the fourth camera until I absolutely need it because I find it's too much jumping around and I hate watching people who do that. And it's like cutting to one camera to the other really, really quickly all the time. You tend to lose it uh, and things like that. So really that is it. That's your only sort of downfalls to it. Uh, and generally have fun. Remember, it's supposed to be fun. And the one thing you will learn is you will spend for every hour you're filming yourself you'll spend three hours editing it 
well normally that's what you tend to do uh, purely because you know you try and going back and looking at it seeing if there's a better angle things like that and everything else like that it's easy if you can afford it and you have something like Vegas um, movie studio things like that because you can do editing like they do on the telly where you have multiple monitors like I have set up with all the feeds and I can be a bit like a director and go camera one to camera two to camera three four but when I was doing it cheaper you don't usually have that option um, you know so that can be a bit of a headache and then if you start to you know hate editing and stuff like that it will show in your builds and then that way you know perhaps they don't come out so well because I see other people and their editing is not quite as polished shall we say and it makes watching it quite hard okay and things like that but again it's personal choice everybody likes things different ways so what I like doing this way people might not like watching another way and things like that so really you find your own niche for it your angles you like to work with your camera setup you like to work with and everything else like that it's just that i wouldn't recommend going out and spending a fortune on cameras because don't forget we've probably got i hate to think how many thousands of pounds worth of gear we've got in here and cameras sound systems lighting and all things like that let alone editing is a thousand pound sweep uh, for something like that or a thousand dollars for the editing stuff so it gets very expensive very very quickly and it can take away your fun of actually doing the hobby and that's obviously the last thing you want to do Okay, uh, do, do, do. Ari says, hi Phil, uh, could you ever make a comparison between the differences, sorry, the different references for jets, for example, Phantoms, Tornadoes, Jaguar, Jaguars, etc. What are the most important and what, uh, um, sorry, and what do you look for in references? Uh, I'm looking for references for the right uh, panel lines and riveting drawings. Okay, my thing here, I should have really prepared for this. Uh, <clears throat> right, let's just have one of those type things. Let's have one of those type things. Okay, there's a couple of companies out there who do absolutely amazing reference books. I find books are the best way. You can always get pictures off the net and all the rest of it, but usually there's a problem. You can't quite get that angle or whatever you're after. The first one, which I absolutely love, is Fox 2. They do, this is one on the Tornado. So you've got full all over pictures and then you start to get down into the nitty gritty of every panel, every line, every weapon, every single part of it. Now these books aren't cheap. Um, sometimes you can pick them up cheaper, but generally they are one of those things. It's a one-off buy. You're only gonna need to do it once and you'll have everything in there. They also will have, like this one does, this guy. So this is scale drawings of the tornado in, like this is 48 scale, okay? But this will show you every rivet, every line, every panel that you could ever want, okay? So when you're putting re-riveting details and things like that, these are a must because you're not gonna get this off of perhaps like your instructions and things like that. These are gonna be spot on because these are proper scale drawings of the actual thing and also other things you get down here like pile on some of the weapons and the various bits and pieces as well showing you the different versions uh, and things like that so this one is by fox 2 they do a couple of other books as well okay for different aircraft the other one which i actually love is jake um i don't these ones these are this is the viper guide again every single picture and drawing you can imagine okay exactly the same type of thing there's a couple other manufacturers or companies publishing companies out there who do the same things i just love them they're easy you can just pick them up and you know there'll be a picture in there of what you need other than that google is your friend there's loads of walk around photos loads of things on the internet and generally you might be able to get some of the images that way you might have seen i usually have a book on the go when we're doing we have one for the intruder we have one for the hind i've got another one for the phantom uh, and most of the things and when we've done other big projects i tend to try and get a good reference book something else like that but as i said if you didn't know shout about it in the forum somebody will tell you which one you need to get and probably where to get it as well okay uh de -de -de. right okay so spencer ask hi phil uh many thanks uh for diving deep into ak metal paints uh on a real world build on the starfighter what are the chances of you doing the same in the future with vallejo metal colors i.e given a comparison between the two or do you know enough from testing on plastic card that vallejo's won't be up to the scratch okay got asked this question 
quite a lot, shall we say, over the weekend. And after I spoke to uh, Fernando from AK, I had a good meeting with him, and I had a long chat as well with Alex from uh, Vallejo. Uh, so both manufacturers actually um, who came in to talk about thank you for doing what we've done for them. Um, my, from what I was telling everybody is if you want a metalizer paint now, from my opinion, go and get a case. Okay, this is for your metalizer type paint. All right, this is because they are basically very easy to use, so much easier than Alclad. Okay. They've got a quarter of the smell to our cloud as well, so they're not smelly as they used to be, okay? Minimal overspray, uh, and by that I mean as well is like particles in the airborne. For some reason, if I'm spraying our cloud, I can go along and you touch anywhere and I've got silver. You know, it's like the old fairy dust absolutely everywhere. Did this one, and to be honest, we did a lot in the booth. We did some here, but nothing more than anyone else, and I had no trace of it anywhere at all, full stop in the studio. I've gone around, I've felt for it, and I can't find it anywhere. So from my point of view, for a hot product or a metalizer finish on something big, okay, then I will always go down the AK route from now on until something better comes along. Now, if you want a acrylic, which is, let's face it, easier, cleaner, and all the rest of it, from the health point of views, right the way down to smell and all things like that, then um, obviously I'll go down the Vallejo route. Now, are they as good as each other? No, okay, because it is the thing. The Vallejo stuff is an acrylic, it's slightly thicker, okay? Because it's thicker, it's more hard wearing, so I don't think you'd wear through it any time like we did with the AK stuff, all right? But, if you're going to be doing an F, you know, 104 Starfighter like we've just done, I would always use the AK stuff rather than the Vallejo because I don't think the Vallejo will quite do it. Now, if I didn't have the AK stuff, I think I'd be more than happy though with the results from the AK. But when you put them side by side, I think the AK is going to nudge it a little bit. But if you remember, we used it on the bike. Now, a lot of people looked at the Ducati over the weekend. Thank you for your all kind comments. And obviously, a lot of metalizer in there was actually using the Vallejo stuff as well. And you can't tell the difference between what's AK and what's Vallejo in there. Okay, that is because they're so close. The only time I think it really gets out of hand is that if you had something like a big project, so perhaps we're talking 130 second stuff, uh, and, you know, all over metal finishes, the AK stuff's always going to look better, I think, than the Vallejo. But if you're doing smaller jobs, perhaps on armor, things like that, sci-fi, you could readily get away with the Vallejo stuff. That's not to say I wouldn't use the Vallejo to do a Mustang or something else like that, because I said, if you think you didn't have anything else, it would look spot on. So I was speaking to a lot of you, and a few of you were actually saying, but you wouldn't use um, Alclad, you wouldn't use the AK, you're after an acrylic, and then I've said, just get the Vallejo stuff. It really is that good. It's fantastic. It's a really, really nice finish and everything else like that. What I might do is actually hash together the other F-104's body, just put the body together and do it in the actual um, Vallejo stuff as well, just to have a go with it, just to see, and that way I can show you what I mean on a side-by-side. -side. I don't think it's gonna look as good as the actual AK stuff, but from a, a point of view of a standalone, I think it'll be fine. As long as you haven't got it up against something else, it will look absolutely fine. Okay, so, um, Jeff asks, uh, how many models have you built? Crikey, I've put this in the forum, a couple of the guys had a bit of fun, thought we'd see how many you'd done. Uh, and I imagine it will make most of our totals pretty paltry in comparison. Love the site, keep up the good work. Uh, I may come say hello at Telford, I hope you did. Um, okay, how many models? Well, if you think at one point I was building over 100 a year uh, when I was doing commission work. Uh, a lot of you know my commission, I did 257 F-18 Hornets, um, which actually rose afterwards because I did then some afterwards uh, in the space over sort of two years uh, and things like that. So, you know, it, it's a lot. It's like three a week, something else like that was my average run when I was doing that type of work, contract work. Generally though, nowadays I'm probably down, as you said, we've done something like 20 this year in total builds so you know i've been doing it a few years now and all the rest of it commission work i think i must be in the thousands now uh from total if you include things like when we did the red arrows we did nine red arrows in a week uh so that'd be nine there or you're talking like the big stuff 
obviously takes a little bit longer but generally we are I've got to be in a thousands in the thousands somewhere I'm not sure exactly where but I could probably go back and tally them all up uh, from my photos and all the rest of it but generally yeah I'm thinking you know five years doing three a week was the average so yeah it, it suddenly mounts up no time at all so yeah I would say over a thousand okay what else have we got uh ding, ding, ding. okay andrew hi phil how are we doing timer okay uh a question about the revel tornado uh you built with the all over camo i want to go with the german box art uh scheme uh how would you recommend blending and fading the light gray to dark gray uh to the black at the rear uh the paint uh, did do, do, do the paints uh, so it does seamlessly blend without airbrush splatter it literally is that thing as you're saying it you're just gonna have to blend it what you want to do is um, sometimes a paper tape plate is quite nice and quite handy because you can work out how far you've got to go on your model so it's all gonna line up with the decals and everything else as it goes back on it but all you're gonna basically do is start with obviously your lightest color first and work to the darkest so obviously probably working from the front you're just going to go in and you could do the entire thing and then to do your blended way it's just that thing of dusting down so you either want to start from if you wanted to from the back and work your way forward so it's going light so all you're going to do is literally just be pulling off the trigger and pulling off your distance okay so you're going less paint less close and it will just feather into each other and you should be able to blend seamlessly one to the other but it is just that thing dusty coats and then if you want to get darker you're just going to slow down and get closer in okay and that will give you a darker pattern then you're going to change color and you're going to blend again across for the different colors of gray really it's that simple it's just a case of working out where they all are um, some people over the weekend we spoke about different camo patterns things like that uh, and so obviously special markings where you have to lay down the color then the decal goes goes over the top it's the same type of thing roughly work out exactly where it is and where you need it to change color and then do it accordingly just like that but you need to get mapped out in your mind how it's going to look on the model and where you want it to start to blend otherwise what's going to end is you're going to end up going too far in different directions and then sometimes the decals don't match up with the color that you've put behind it and things like that but generally just a case of fading without getting the sort of splatter it is that thing of just thinning the paint a little bit so when you go in so you don't cover as heavy either so don't go in there with like neat paint do your 50 50 mix and then perhaps another 10 percent thinners so it's a little bit thinner than normal takes a little bit more time to build up you'll get a smoother finish anyway and you should be good to go like that okay so uh graham says hi phil and the team how do you uh, go about filling the gap between canopies and clear parts uh, the canopy masking is very close to the edge to be sanded or smoothed once filled um, and is it easy to damage uh, or moved? Any tips we gratefully received? All round canopies, normally I go in with PVA glue, okay? If you've got something that's a really nasty canopy, okay, which is a little bit thick, then you've got a couple of options, and I don't think I've got them around here anymore. He says with his stiff neck. Um, do, do, do. Let's have a look, I think this will do for one. One of them is to go through with the old um, Vallejo plastic stuff. Uh, plastic putty this one what you can actually do is squirt it in the crack and then come along with a all the cotton buds out of here okay uh, a damp q-tip or cotton bud and just wipe clean it okay you'll get minimal shrinkage okay and that will fill the gap in without having to sand it afterwards and all those nasty things like that you can do just the same with pva glue which is my chosen way of doing it you put the pva glue in wipe clean it let it dry because obviously that's the gap as well it filled the gap if you get a sink mark just come in with the second coat and put that over the top but you say any of the plastic putties or the other one which is the this one down here perfect plastic putty we like as well because they're water based you can actually clean them up with a cotton bud and just wipe them out of the way and they'll be absolutely fine so you won't have to worry about those and any damage caused by sanding because you will do it all with a clean cotton bud and because it's water as well no harmful or anything else like that okay right on to the next page getting through today a couple more questions <coughs> if my voice holds out we'll be fine okay uh, Matt says, just wondering how you'd go about uh, making your styrene liquid filler. Is it just a case of uh, chopping up some sprue bits uh, and putting in some ultra thin glue? 
Right, okay, we've covered this and I see Hans has popped in and he's done a link as well. We've got a full section on making this. Go and have a look at it in there. But yeah, in essence, I don't think sprue works as good as styrene sheet. Um, sprue, not all sprues are equal in a nutshell. Okay, but go and have a look and I see you put in there that you've done. Thanks for hands into that one. Anyway, okay, so Malcolm, he says, just a quick question. Love the review of the Ming Terminator. Uh, it's not on the review page, it is now. I did that one, because <laughs> I must admit I forgot to put it in there. Then I went back and did that one. Hi Phil, do you use uh, uh, polarized filters on your cameras? They will help with problems with reflections. It's not as quite as simple as that. When you've got a studio effect with LED banks of lightings and all the rest of it, putting filters on things, it's when you're doing still photography, you just take a photo, it's fine. But with video in, it's a completely different ball game because light is changing all the time by shadows and colors it's shooting against. So trust me, we had to go with filters. <laughs> it didn't end well, not at all. It's okay if you've got a cameraman who can adjust it all, but when things are usually locked off for white balances, and that's why we always use these. I always have one to hand. We have these guys because what it is, is before we tend to shoot each day, then obviously we have one of these. And there we go, it's another question. Somebody's asking about essentials. Buy yourself one of these. This is one of those ones so you can lock the white balance uh, off completely on all your cameras. So obviously when you're dealing with something, you know, that is a funny color in that, if it locks onto your hand, it's gonna look different on the model. So we lock them off onto these guys. And then obviously we've got everything set for the day because the cameras do have a habit of changing over time. Okay, de -de -de. Uh, Anthony says, hi Phil, uh, I'm going to be up on Telford on Saturday. I'm thinking about treating myself to a hard and steam at Infinity Airbrush. I'm using the Evo and absolutely love it. Uh, is your opinion of the fin Infinity any much better than the Evolution? We covered this a lot, probably a bit late now, and I don't want to burst your bubble. But in a nutshell, the features that you use on the Evo, which we speak about all the time, it's my CR Plus, Really, we are talking about the trigger, because the trigger on this, you can slightly adjust it by this little collar at the back here. Okay, you can tighten it up, and what this does is change a slight bit of tension on the trigger. Okay, so it makes it a little bit harder to pull, which comes in quite handy if you want to do very fine detail work, because the trigger's not just all sloppy uh, and all over the place. Okay, so from that point of view, you should get a, a really nice uh, trigger pull and a trigger response. But basically, it's this guy in here, the inner one, the more you push it in, the more resistance is on the trigger. You know, it puts quite a lot of resistance on. And then if you slacken off this collar at the back here, it makes the trigger really sloppy, um, which is sometimes better, it's personal preference. And then obviously the biggest thing is this thing on the back where you can lock the distance. Also with the Infinity, you can get to your needle and retract it. What you could do if it was screwed up. Okay, if we just screw it up, you can actually pull the needle back and retract it manually on the back and rotate it quarter to retract the trigger and stuff like that. Is it worth it? You're gonna be paying another 60, 70 quid for it. If you can afford it, why not? Just go, because this is the top of the range. This is the big one that does absolutely everything. Is it worth it? From a modeling point of view, I don't use any of these gizmos and gadgets and all the rest of it. I think sometimes, you know, they can be a little bit gimmicky. But then, to be honest, when we were doing the touch-in work on the Starfighter, it did come in because I locked the trigger off to be a tiny little spray pattern. So every time I pulled, I can only move the trigger a tiny bit, so I had no risk of flooding anything. So for doing that type of thing, it comes in. But as I said, that's the first time I've used that feature on this particular airbrush for well, more moons than I can imagine, okay? So yeah, it's just one of those things. If you can afford it, it's tight, high end, it's beautiful, it's very, very nice. If you've got an Evo that you would know probably not a lot of difference between the two. It's just that a couple of little gizmos on there can make things a little bit nicer and a bit easier, and it looks a little bit more blingy. <laughs> okay, what do we get? One more in here. Okay, what do we got? Lee says, Phil, uh, you've mentioned oiling your airbrush needle. Uh, do you smear it on the needle itself, or do you just put a drop onto the body of the airbrush? Uh, won't it contaminate the paint? What I tend to do is, which is a good example here because my needle is actually jammed. Okay, so what you can do, do the needle up and then retract. Okay, 
what can happen is when you feel down your actual needle, you'll feel a ridge. And this is where the seals are for the on this one, Teflon seals, which is the real one, which is around about halfway in your airbrush up the stem here. Okay. Now the thing is, is that if you put a little bit of oil in there, and I do believe it's in here still, if I moved it all, no, we're in, in the brush bits now, wherever they are. Find them all in there. No, perhaps I haven't yet, perhaps they're still good here. Oh yes, uh, so in here somewhere, there we have super loop, no sniggering at the back. What I tend to do is I'll put the nozzle needle set in. You know you've got the collet at the back here, I haven't got the overhead camera on today, but what I tend to do is I'll just put a drop just down the back there, just like that. Okay, and then we're just gonna pick up a little bit on the needle and then we're gonna push it in. Now the thing is, when you slide it in, you should technically put butt up against this rear seal and the oil is being held back. It shouldn't actually take it down in there any further. And I'm looking down at the needle and I can't see any on there. So what happens is now this is really, where it was jammed before, it's very springy very nice and all the rest of it. A couple of other things you can actually do is on some of them, you've got this, you can lock it off on these somewhere. Where's the tooth? No, here it is. There we go, lock back. If you put a tiny bit on the body, just back there, this is that shaft which it goes round. Okay, so that sort of sits on there. Then when you lock it back in, retract and pull the needle. This just makes it all nice and slippy and smooth and everything else around down the back and then what I usually do, just grab a little bit of tissue, just to clean off all the excess. And to be honest, that's really, really nice now. Yet when I started this, I was, it was, well, not nice at all. Okay, so there we go. So then that goes in, pop your back on. And it's really, it just all falls. It's nice, it's clean and all the rest of it. How often to do it? That'll be the next question when it sticks don't you know you could routinely give your airbrush maintenance once a week i tend to do it when it just jams and feels horrible and all the rest of it and that's feeling really really nice now and if i just slacken off my trigger because i always have mine quite slack yeah no problem at all really really nice okay go on one more okay terry says phil and team uh very new to modeling uh, at the moment just building and trying to build uh armor Finding a lot, uh, finding it a lot harder uh, when to clear coat, how to build tracks, when to brush paint, but I'm loving it. Uh, finally, at 46, I have found a hobby I love. Uh, I've just bought a load of Star Wars Bandai kits, <laughs> uh, but I'm not sure if I should clear coat before adding the decals. Uh, do I clear coat after I have finished uh, the build? Is it okay to use uh, Mr. Spray? Uh, so yeah, Mr. Spray uh, can clear coat. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Mr. Hobby Spray can clear coat. Uh, thanks a lot, Terry. Welcome back to the hobby. Okay, or into the hobby, should I say? Okay, so basically, um, Clear coating is just a way of protecting something when you finished it, okay? So there's no right and wrong when you should do it. If you're gonna give a coat of clear coat, traditionally it was always do it before decaling, okay? And then that was it, you put your decals on and flat coat over the top. Now we do a little bit more weathering and things. I tend to clear coat at sort of regular stages. So once I finish my paintwork, I might clear coat it in preparation for any other type of weathering. Now that could be post shading, it could be sort of, you know, sanding some paintwork back to make it more weathered looking. Uh, it may be just a case of going in with, you know, various things all over it, okay? So it's just a case of, right, you've finished a particular thing, like your paintwork, I'm now gonna protect it, all right? And it'll just make things tougher, you know, not as valuable and all the rest of it, all right? Then obviously you wanna clear coat before you decollate, just so they've got a smoother finish to go on to minimize your silvering and all the rest of it. Then you wanna clear coat again before you come in with any washes, because technically I would always use our uh, flory wash, something else like that, right the way over the model, just to give it depth, panel line washes, armor, anything else like that, uh, right the way through. But again, it protects the decals from that layer, okay? And then afterwards, I would then come in with your clear coat, again, being as your final one is satin, 
gloss, um, you know, or a flat or whatever you're going to go for your final finish. So it's just a case of when you do it, you just do it when you feel you need to protect your work at that time. So you're happy with the paintwork, put a clear coat over it, okay? So when you move in with someone else, if it went slightly wrong, the chances are you could get rid of it and start again. So many a time I might have clear coated gone in with some post shading don't like it tiny bit of airbrush cleaner on a cotton bud i can take care of it and wipe it away without going down into the paintwork because it's protected under that clear coat uh, and i would have to rub quite hard to get down to that one and then versus at the end of something you might be going in there with some streaking or some oils or whatever you want to do or some chipping if you didn't like it if you've got a clear coat protecting it between the layer below you can get in there wipe it away and start afresh so really it's just that thing of when you think i'm happy with that i'm going to seal it and then move on to the next level. That's really when your clear coat should go down. There we go, that will do. Let me put a full stop thumb up in that. Try again. There we go. That's it for today. Thank you for joining us. My voice is just about on its way out again after this. I'll go and rest it up and gargle some cold tea or something. So there we go. We're going to be back obviously tomorrow. We've got the final part. Uh, it's going to be up with you with the Starfighter. And then on Thursday, we're going to put up the special on uh, AK and our findings with it and all the bits and pieces for obviously non-members really to see it. Or if you haven't seen the build, you can look at a very concise short down version about using metalizer paint and weathering and stuff like that afterwards, um, you know, with the AK stuff. So that's going to be up on Thursday. And then Friday, funnily enough, you're going to get a review about that one. Mel will probably make me review it. So, uh, but on Friday, definitely we're going to have the X15 down here. I've got other stuff down here to review that's coming over the last past week as well. Plus the fact all the Bandai stuff and bits and pieces and everything runs with it. So this is me signing off with a very sore throat again after doing this, but I'll catch you all tomorrow. So until tomorrow, everybody, happy modeling and take care.